All right, well, welcome everyone uh, this afternoon to the Finance Committee meeting number 5-23. It's Thursday, June 8, 2023, and this meeting is being held on Zoom and at the Water Center, or well, actually, yeah, at the Water Center, in uh, the conference room, 648A, and uh, it's 1, 1 p.m. Mountain Time and noon Pacific. Before we start, I just wanted to say that um, the purpose of this meeting is basically to listen to the presentations uh, of the priority projects that are on the board's um, regional sustainability project list. And this is the second finance committee meeting for those projects. Um, there'll be no funding decisions made today. It's basically to provide information on these specific projects to all of the finance committee and other board members participating in this meeting today. So with that, I think we're at introductions and attendance. Okay, Madam Chair, um, as far as uh, water board members and finance committee members, you have all of the finance committee members uh, in attendance. Um, yourself, we have Dean Stevenson, Mark Gibbs, Dale Van Stone, and Jeff Rabel. And then we other board members participating in the meeting are Pat McMahon and Brian Olmstead. I uh, have not, not seen Al Barger join, join the meeting yet. Okay. And then we'll have um, Jennifer just to make note of those that are, are uh, on the Zoom meeting and those that are here in the office and record those for the minutes. All right. Okay, thank you, Jennifer, for doing that. The next item on our agenda is the first presentation from for today from the New York Canal Lining Project people. Who will be making that presentation? Well, I'm Bob Carter. I'm the project manager for the Boise Project Board of Control. Perfect. Okay, are we ready? Yeah. We're ready. We okay, I will try to share my screen real quick here. Yeah. Okay, can you see that? Yes. I can. Yeah. Okay. All right. We ready to go? All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about a modern canal lining system that the Boise Project has been using for the last 10 years to upgrade the canal to today's modern engineering standards, all while providing increased public safety, clean hydropower, agricultural economic benefits and water savings. Oops, let me get my... Okay, the construction of the New York Canal was started in the 1880s and completed in 1909. The engineers of the time had great vision and foresight to bring this precious resource to the area farmers and make the desert come to life. Without this vital piece of infrastructure, the Treasure Valley would not be what it is today. In 1926, the Boise Project Board of Control was formed to take over operations and maintenance of the New York Canal and the irrigation infrastructure that it feeds. The Boise Project, a little background, is the operating agent for five irrigation districts, New York Irrigation, Boise Cuna Irrigation, a portion of Nampa Meridian Irrigation, Wilder Irrigation, and Big Bend Irrigation. Our purpose is to manage the irrigation facilities and other works transferred by the United States Bureau of Reclamation to these five irrigation districts and to deliver water to their landowners. These facilities are referred to as transferred works. Boise Project delivers surface irrigation water from the both Boise River rights and reservoir storage rights in Anderson and Arrow Rock reservoirs held by the United States Bureau of Reclamation in trust for the districts. The New York Canal is the main delivery canal. And in these pictures, these old pictures when it was being built, please take notice of the open spaces and the lack of houses in this area. So the New York Canal starts at Diversion Dam below Lucky Peak and meanders 41 miles to Lake Lowell, an off-stream reservoir in Canyon County. It was originally designed for a capacity of 2,850 CFS. But over the years and the maintenance done, such as concrete and or asphalt overlays, 
we have a capacity of approximately 2,450 CFS today, which is more than the Boise River normally runs throughout the summer. This slide shows the area that the New York Canal ultimately provides water to, approximately 165,000 acres of land. Starting in the highly urbanized areas of southeastern Boise, it goes through Meridian, Cuna, Melba, Nampa, Caldwell, Greenleaf, Wilder, and Big Bend, Oregon. The delivery system comprises of over 1,500 miles of canals, laterals, and sublaterals. More than 10,000 individual structures, including head gates and check structures, and is operated by a full time staff of approximately 100 dedicated employees. Improvements on the canals and laterals are done on a yearly basis and including but not limited to piping, lining, and recleaning. As the New York Canal was designated as an urban canal of concern by the Bureau of Reclamation, the Boise Project has been working proactively on rehabilitating and improving the canal to today's modern standards. The design for this improvement has been approved by the engineers at the Bureau of Reclamation and includes a geocomposite membrane that consists of polyester non-wovens bonded to a polyethylene geomembrane. The liner is inert to biological degradation and naturally encountered yeah. chemicals, alkalis, and acids. The liner has superior puncture resistance and increased interface fraction pro properties that allow the liner to be deployed directly in contact with existing soils and steep side slopes. The life expectancy of the liner is 50 years, and with the six inch steel reinforced concrete cap added to it, we should get 75 to 100 years. It has been deemed virtually bulletproof. So this map shows the approximate six mile stretch of the New York Canal that runs from Eckert Road to just past Interstate 84. This section has become highly urbanized and in most of this area, the canal sits on a bench up to 60 feet above most of the urbanization below it. This is a depiction of the changes in growth the area has seen. Remember the first slides of construction and the lack of houses? Well, things have certainly changed. In 1939, the area population was approximately 25,000, and today the area has a population of approximately 240,000. Unfortunately, in 1955, there was a breach of the New York Canal in this area. A 200-foot section of the canal's north bank washed out, and damage was caused to property below the canal. And you can see there's just hardly any housing right there at that time. Fortunately, in 1955, the area was mostly farmland and had few houses, whereas in 2023, the area along the New York Canal is highly urbanized. The breach caused close to $100,000 in claims, an equivalent of $1,044,000 in today's dollars. If a breach were to occur today, the damage and destruction would be more severe and costly due to the high density of the homes and structures, not to mention the potential loss of lives. Some of the other benefits the canal has, the Boise project has five low head hydropower power plants within our system, which provide clean, no carbon footprint power to many homes and businesses. Three of these operate only during the irrigation season but Arrow Rock Power Plant, located at the Arrow Rock Dam, can operate throughout the year depending on the water level of Arrow Rock Reservoir. The New York Canal contributes to an agriculture economy of over a billion dollars annually, as well as other indirect economic impacts. Reliable water is paramount to sustained agricultural production that keeps the communities in this area vibrant and productive. Through the five irrigation districts that are served by the New York Canal, close to 50% of the irrigated lands in Ada and Canyon counties are affected by this canal. The Bureau of Reclamation performed a seepage water loss survey throughout the summer of 2022 to quantify the amount of seepage lost in a 7.7 .7 mile stretch of the New York Canal, which encompassed the six mile stretch we are proposing to line. This aligns with a study done in 1997 by USGS over the same stretch. And on this chart, you can see where they did it and the results are there. The Bureau study shows that 
the loss over these six miles to be 29,370.28 acre feet annually. By lining this six mile section, the conserved water will remain in the reservoirs longer, making it easier to refill the system. We'll have water available for our patrons in low water years. We can still produce clean hydropower for longer periods, and it will benefit fish and wildlife species in and around the reservoirs. So our normal irrigation season cycle starts in April, continues until October. The normal maintenance cycle starts as soon as water goes out, usually in October, and continues until March. We can also divert water to Lake Lowell any time between November and March, depending on the year and water supply. That doesn't leave us a big window to get all of our maintenance done throughout the 1,500 miles of canals and laterals. So of this new process, we start by ripping out any of the old liner and over excavating the prism of the canal the day after water goes out of the canal. The reason we over excavate serves two purposes. First, when we backfill and compact the material, we are compacting to today's engineering standards. And second, we are building it back to the original capacity of 2,850 CFS. We then reshape the canal prism and compact both sides and the floor, prepping the canal for the geocomposite membrane and steel reinforced concrete. The geocomposite membrane, the thickest that Husker liner has available, is then placed in the canal. You'll notice the trench, which is where we will leave a tag end that we can attach to for the following year's section of liner. The seams are hot glued together and once sealed it is virtually one continuous piece of material. Next comes the laying of form boards for the placing of the six inch thick steel reinforced concrete. The concrete is then placed and worked with a roller screed to give it a nice smooth finish. Now I have a time-lapse video that shows the entire process. As soon as water goes out in the fall, our guys come in the next day, start removing the old material. We put this together with the bureau. We planted a camera and it turned out pretty nice to show the entire process, give you an idea of what we're doing here. They come in, excavate, remove things, compact it to today's standards. Remember, well, this is all weather dependent, which you'll see in a minute here what happens. <laughs> we start putting uh, liner in sections. Under the canal, sometimes there are, uh, underneath the canal, there's some uh, water that can run under from the up uphill side. So we patch those in, shaping the canal. Once it's all compacted and shaped, it'll start getting ready for the liner. Once the liner's all put in place and hot glued, they start forming it up with steel reinforced concrete, six inches on both sides on the floor. As you can see, it's quite a process, but after 10 years of experience with this, we have become pretty efficient. However, due to time, budget, workload constraints, and our crew size, we're only able to complete between 400 and 600 feet per year. And, that, and at that rate, it will take over 50 years to complete the six mile stretch of highly urban <clears throat> town. And it's ready for water. And that brings us to why we're here today. We are asking for $50 million in order to facilitate the hiring of a contractor that will be capable of completing a mile of lining per year and complete the six miles in six years versus the current pace of a 50 year timeline. This is our budget here, and we have included a 3% increase per year for price increases, which we all know is a very conservative inc increase in today's uncertain economy. So the first year, it's approximately 7.9 million per mile to get it done. 
with the 3% increase over the six years, we end up with a total of just over $51 million. These are some other potential funding opportunities available. The first two are currently being utilized by the Boise Project to complete a mile over the next five years if no other funding sources become available. We have also applied for a grant through NRCS, but are waiting to see if we are eligible for it. With these grants, the Boise Projects must match $8.5 million, which puts a burden on our budget as well as our patrons' assess assessments. And this is our project timeline as as follows. The first part is environmental and cultural compliance. The Bureau is currently working on the environmental and cultural compliance, which should be completed by September of 2023. And then if funding is available, we would then solicit bids for contractors. Once that is completed, we can implement the rest of the six year schedule. Uh, the Boise Project is asking for $50 million in funding so that we can hire a contractor to complete the six mile section of the New York Canal Lining Project in six years versus the 50 years it will currently take. This will help ensure the public safety of the thousands of people who have encroached on this vital piece of infrastructure due to urbanization over the past decades. By lining this section and conserving water that will remain in the reservoirs, we can continue to produce clean hydropower and the conserved water will still be available to water users, which benefits us all. Upgrading and modernizing the canal by using advanced materials in an effort to degree, decrease the risk of a canal breach will help ensure the continued reliability of this vital piece of infrastructure. Idaho's agricultural economy can continue to flourish. And lastly, the, the expected annual water savings of 29,000 acre feet will remain in the reservoirs longer, making it easier to refill each year and will be available to agricultural producers more reliably during times of drought. This project will play a small but important part in strengthening the water supply sustainability by allowing the conserved water to be used instead of seeping into the ground, thereby keeping the diversions down and the reservoirs at a higher level. The water conservation will also decrease the demand and usage on city water and wells, which benefits groundwater levels. As we have demonstrated here today, this is a shovel ready project with 10 years of experience that we are proactively trying to complete in a relatively short time frame that will benefit not only our patrons, but the entire Treasure Valley. In comparison to some other projects, 29,000 acre feet of water savings, safety and reliability, economic contributions, and clean, reliable hydropower for a cost of $50 million is a pretty good investment. And I thank you for this opportunity to showcase our project. And I don't know if you're taking que or ask asking questions, but uh, we're here for you. Yes, let's open it up to questions. Are there any questions? Madam Chairman, this is Jeff. A um, couple of questions. Uh, of that 29,000 acre feet of, of water that would be saved by lining this section of the channel, do you have a breakdown or an estimate of how much of that would be uh, just natural flow water and how much of that would actually be saved storage water? I would say it's probably mostly all storage water because it would just stay in the reservoir instead of being used, you know, to for carrying water or whatever. Okay. There there are no other junior water right holders who would utilize that natural flow if you no. weren't converting it? No. It would be our, our storage water that we have the water rights for. Mm -hmm. We just wouldn't need to add extra water in our diversions to cover the seepage that we're currently losing. So it would still remain, you know, the, the storage right holders, which are our patrons. Okay. Then the other question, you, your timeline, uh, is that timeline based on about how much of the work you think you can get done in a season or just how aggressively you think you can acquire funding? So... As I stated, our crew, we can only accomplish four to 600. We can maybe push a thousand, but we have 
a lot of other jobs to do as well. So we've been in talks with a couple of different big contractors just to get a feel for uh, what they can accomplish. And both, all three of them have said uh, that they can comfortably feel that they can get close to a mile a year. So that's where that time frame came from, six years to do six miles. Okay. So if you had two contractors, you could do two miles a year? Well, there's a, a little that... bit of a problem with a pinch point in that canal. So you'd be oh. stepping on each other. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Madam Chair, this is Brian. Uh, question for, is it Bob that's presenting? Yes, it is, Brian. Hi, Bob. Um, hey, Brian. So I remember when we toured, you showed us you have the um, siphons that make your deliveries in that. Is that true in the whole stretch? You don't have to put any pipes through your liner. They all go above water line. Well, there's a few uh, head gates that still remain, but if we can, we try to put those siphons in, but uh, I, in that stretch, there's there's a few head gates still remaining. And and that works okay with your liner. You just have to be... Yes. Just a lot of extra work probably to, to get around it. Yeah. But that liner, we put that all behind the head gates as well. So it virtually seals off everything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bob, I have a question. Uh, how much... How many acre feet of water did you anticipate saving by lining the canal? It was about 20,000 acre feet a year is what I believe they said. 29, I'm sorry, 29,000. Thank you. Are there any other questions? What, Joanne, this is Mark. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what's that 29,000 acre feet storage? Uh, savings. How much of that ends up in the aquifer? Do they do they figure uh, what's it going to do the, to the water table in that area if they if they save the water? So there are still currently some studies going on with groundwater right here, and you know there's still going to be uh, water that's going into the aquifer, but you know that you know that's not really the canals were designed to distribute water to the to the farmers and we're our, our duty is to keep the water in the canals. So, it, it, you know, it won't really affect this area that we're going through the six miles has a pretty high water table currently. In fact, that's why there's drainage districts and, and pumps that are put in there because they've had high water table issues, you know, from the beginning. So uh, we don't feel that it should affect this area of the bench area at all. Minimally, I guess I should say. Okay, so one last question, Bob. Are your patrons willing to contribute to this project for that 29,000 acre feet of savings and storage? Well, that's something, we, you know, we'd have to run through uh, all the districts. And we've had several uh, town hall meetings, I guess I'll call them. And, you know, everybody's on board with this, uh, you know, to, to make this canal a safer, more reliable canal. Um, as far as ponying up money, you know, nobody enjoys that, but, you know, if you have to do that, you have to do that. So, but that's something with, you know, bridge we'd have to cross. Okay. So currently you're asking the Water Resource Board to fund the entire project 100%. Is that correct? <laughs> that's my understanding that I was told that, you know, to apply for these things and you might as well shoot for uh, the top if you, if you can. You don't, you don't get anything if you don't ask. That's right. Okay. All right. Madam uh, Chair. Yes. One more, one more question from Brian. Uh, Bob, uh, will you be coming to us with the recharge project in a few years? I hope so, because you and I both know your model is going to show that um, your aquifer is going to go down. And uh, I think the lining project is a good idea, but it's at some point, all the development, um, we're going to have to do some recharge in the in the Treasure Valley too. But yes, sir. So currently, we're kind of doing some out at Hubbard Reservoir without any credits. But once we come up with a vehicle to to credit and you know have that in place, 
Yes, sir. We are. We our board has actively been talking about recharge in the future. So uh, we're on the we're on the ground floor, we're waiting to get it get it going. Yes, sir. We'll be looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other last call for questions? <laughs> okay. I'm not seeing any. So thank you, Bob, for that presentation on the New York Canal Lining Project. I think we're ready to move to the next project. Thank you very much. Next product project, Madam Chair, is the Gooding Flood Control Project. And I see Larry Bybee from the city of Gooding. Looks like he's ready to go. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. My name is Larry Bybee. I'm the Public Works Director for the city of Gooding. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share our project. Uh, please bear with me. I have never done this before. I usually have the opportunity to have, uh, I don't usually present like this. So I'm going to uh, fumble through this and you'll just uh, bear with me here. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. If I can find it. Okay, can everybody see it? It has not come up yet, but we're anxiously awaiting. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, let's see. How is that? Yes. It's good. Okay. So, um, and, and again, thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, our project is uh, a little bit of back background. We're calling it the Gooding Flood Control Project. And uh, the purpose of my request is we are at working with the United States Army Corps of Engineers to replace the river wall that, that goes through the middle of our town. Um, this is uh, was was originally going to be 100% funded by the, the Corps of Engineers, but in the, the last couple of years, uh, they have requested a cost share of 10%. And um, for us on a $40 million project, that equates to about $4 million. Uh, this, this is subject to a little bit of change, but it's a number to start with. So what I kind of want to do is, uh, is, is go through the history of how we got to this point. The, the channel was originally constructed in the, in the 1930s by the Works Project Administration um, the, using pretty shoddy materi material. They were using the rock and then, and then mixing concrete and mm -hmm. placing the wall. Um, as early as the 1940s, the, the wall itself began to, to fall apart. Uh, so it was identified in the 90s that there was a need to replace this wall. Uh, so efforts began uh, trying to put together uh, different different methods to do that. They 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 put a, together a couple of word bills. Uh, the first one started at nine million dollars. Uh, by the time they got around to real to realizing construction, they'd already exceeded that funding limit, uh, and the project was scrubbed. In 2018, they came back around uh, and tried to do it again uh, with a 15 million dollar increase for, you know, $15 million cost for the project. Uh, again, that number was exceeded. In between that time, Congressman Simpson uh, went to bat for the community and uh, was able to get the, in the 2022 word of bill, he was able to get it increased to $40 million and a, and a few other things that will help the community uh, try to realize this project and get the work done. What I wanna do is take you on a little tour I don't, I'm not sure how many people have actually uh, been through Gooding. Uh, if you have, I think you're very well aware of the, the infrastructure that we have. This, and, it, and I say this really literally goes right through the middle of town. Um, I'm gonna show you just three slides that kind of emphasize the, the amount of deterioration that's occurred over the years. A lot of it is just uh, ice jams and, and undermining and, and it's just 
it only gets worse every year. It just gets worse and worse. Um, this is this this slide right here is where our park uh, right next to our park, and we we are very conscious of the fact that we have children playing over here, and and we try to really keep an eye on it and make sure that we can keep that area protected and and public away from it. Um, our project schedule is the uh, we have recently because of the bill that the congressman was able to put through, we entered into a cost share agreement with the with the federal government um, to get the design work done on it. And, and so they're moving full steam ahead on that. The, the timeline, if you will, is uh, construction could, but unlikely to occur by the end of the year. And the reason I say unlikely to occur is we have the challenge of, if we had $4 million in the bank, we would be able to to go uh, to be able to enter into a contract with them to begin that work. But the dilemma that we have is that un until we secure funding for our share, uh, we we would have to rely on uh, the possibility of going to a bond uh, and a, and a and a vote by the public to determine whether or not they think this project is viable. We we truly hope that the community recognizes the need as they're the ones that have had to uh, to live with the wall uh, for the last 70 years. So we're, we're hopeful that that would be a positive vote, but, but as we know, projects and, and costs for everything these days have just skyrocketed, skyrocketed and our public is just feeling the pinch of, um, you know, we're, we're all currently working on a wastewater project. Uh, we had, we just recently completed a water project um, they've seen the rate increases for those uh, services go up and up. Um, it, in everybody's mind, it's the tax, the property taxes are an issue. So one more thing to burden them, uh, I fear, is, is maybe too much. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to reach out to as many sources uh, as we can to try to help us with this project. Going back, circling back on, on what we had talked about originally, the federal project is, the budget is about $40 million. We know that part of that was uh, the study and, and additional items that, that kind of subtract from that that have already been covered. So we're literally, we're looking maybe at 37, 38 million, um, but we're still considering our cost share to be 4 million because not only do we have the project cost share, but we also have uh, roads, road repair, sidewalk repair. None of this covers any of the costs that, to the community for having to uh, put back the work that's done that's not directly affected by the project. Um, going through our possible funding sources, I've, I've recently been notified that we had we had put in for a brick grant last year, which is the Building Resilient Communities Grant. We were successful in that, but one of my concerns is that the the grant was originally designed to be for design of bridges, which uh, was a, was originally in the in the uh, project scope, but then two years ago was removed to try to keep the cost down and and keep it within that 902 spending limit. It still didn't meet it, so the bridges uh, because of the the work that Congressman Simpson has done, it allowed those bridges to go back into the project. Um, so I'm not sure that we can, uh, in speaking with, uh, with, with them, they believe that we can use that for a match. And if so, that's, that's great. That's one possible source of revenue. Um, I'm reaching out to you today for your support um, because if, if, we're, if we're successful in, in covering the city's cost share of this project, then we do not have to go out to vote, which means we can get the work done much sooner and our citizens are not burdened by this additional, um, you know, levy that would have to be put on uh, to do the work. Uh, in addition, that to you, the, I mentioned the time frame is that if we have to go to a vote, uh, there's always a possibility it could fail and the project could completely not happen. Um, but then there's also the time that it takes to go through that process and it would delay it into the next year. We also are looking at uh, some 
the, the LTAC or the Local Highway Technical Assistance Council grant. Um, there might be some small funds available through them. Uh, even going further into like the Region 4 Development Community Block Grants. Uh, and again, my last, uh, the last item on my slide is the, is a bond election by the voters. So uh, I went through and I kind of, I kind of wondered, it's like, what would, what would the value be to the, to our outer, Idaho Water Resource Board? The, the river itself obviously serves as flood control for the city. Um, I, I noted that it's a headwater to the Malad. It, it does, uh, as it flows through town, it does meet up with the big wood and then which obviously, as we know, that becomes the, the Malad. There are a, a number of hydro power generation facilities, not in town. That's not, not my intention to imply that it is, but there are certainly infrastructure above stream and down and below stream that, that are affected by that. Um, it, is, it is vital for irrigation. While the city has, has, doesn't currently provide irrigation uh, water to it to the community, we are a vital conduit for the, the companies that utilize it uh, for their purposes. It supports wild, uh, fish and wildlife activities. And, and obviously, we know any river is a great amenity in any community, so it's vital to our economy. One of the things that didn't make my list was the uh, you know, the public safety part of it. For us, uh, it, it literally dissects our community. So having a, having a wall that protects our community is vital. Um, and then, as we know, with flood control, that's, that's the other key component is we always worry about ice jamming, which was one of the issues that's caused the a substantial amount of damage is that the bridges, when originally constructed, were pinch points, and there's five of them along this uh, this channel that they're going to replace. In in the new rebuild, those bridges will be designed not only to handle the traffic that we have, but also um, will will open up those channels and allow for full flow, so there won't be ice jams that they they have seen previously. Um, that's pretty much mine, and I know it wasn't as as nicely put together as my the previous show, that's an amazing project. That's, uh, but anyway, I will stand for any questions that you might have. It appears my internet just went out. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Ma okay. Madam Chair, this is Madam Chair. This is Dean Stevenson. I have a question. All right. Go. Go uh, ahead, Dean. Uh, let me, uh, which canal companies? You know, is there two canal companies that use? That is part of their conveyance for their irrigation water. Yeah, that's correct, Dean. There, they are. There's two of them that are affected. So you've got Big Wood Canal Company, American Falls, that that literally deliver water through that structure, um, and then the um, Northside Canal Company uh, operate that Clover Creek leg that's on the uh, west end of town. So while they don't directly divert through this canal, the that where those tie together. Uh, is there's a diversion, another diversion at where the Littlewood River essentially picks up again on the downstream side of the Twin Falls Canal Company uh, Clover Creek facility. One more question. Is there a flood district there? Not that I'm aware of, Dean. Okay. Th thank you. That's all I had. Any other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Bybee, for your presentation, and we will uh, move on to the move on to the next. Thank you for your time. Okay, next presentation, Madam Chair, is from the uh, Blue Space and Aquifer Water Supply Project. And I see the the the, the team looks like they're ready to go. Yeah, we're here. Thank you. We really appreciate the time. Um, happy to be here, Madam Chair and committee. We are uh, very excited to be presenting uh, on behalf of the Blue Space and Aquifer Committee. I'm Tyler Palmer, and I'm the Deputy City Supervisor for the City of Moscow. Uh, and joining me today is Paul Kimmel, who is a uh, business manager for Avista Utilities and is also the Lake Talk County represent representative on the Blue Space and Aquifer Committee. 
Um, I know this isn't the first time that most of you have heard from us uh, up here in the Palouse Basin. We've been working on uh, an alternate water supply for decades. Um, it's something that uh, is imperative for our communities. As most of you know, Moscow is the home of the state's land grant university, the University of Idaho, and we share a basin. Uh, the, the other major pumping entities in the basin, other than the city of Moscow and University of Idaho, are Washington State University and the city of Pullman, which is the land grant university for the state of Washington. And so we're a relatively small area, uh, but with a big influence and a lot of importance uh, for both states. Um, and our water issue is one that is relatively well known. And so we've got a presentation today to update you on our progress toward an alternate water supply um, and, uh, and field any questions that you might have. So I am going to share my screen, hopefully share the right screen to you all. Are you seeing a PowerPoint presentation? Yes. All right. So uh, the Blue Space Dock for Committee, as many of you may be aware, uh, we, we are in Lake Tom, Whitman counties. Um, as I mentioned, Moscow, Idaho, uh, Pullman, Washington, University of Idaho, Washington State. Uh, we also incorporate the smaller city of Palouse. Uh, there had been some questions as to whether Colfax, Washington was included in the basin, but with recent research, we've been able to um, determine that they are actually outside of the Palouse Basin. Um, so the map, the map that you see here is the most updated map that represents the boundaries of the Palouse Basin. And really, this is a story of a basin in decline. It has been since the area was settled. Uh, the the Poland-Moscow area was largely settled in the late 1800s. Uh, the existence of artesian wells here was one of the drivers for the placement of the land-grant universities because of the availability of water. Um, we're in a little bit of an interesting situation here on the Palouse because uh, we have dry land farming. It's a highly fecund farming area here, um, but it's mostly dry land farming. And so where most areas have agriculture as a major player and contributor to the conversation about water, uh, the water here is largely an urban issue. Uh, the, the major pumpers are, and the major users are not agriculture. It, it is the cities and the urban areas. Um, when uh, water levels were started to be tracked, they were declining earlier in the century at almost three feet per year. And that was in the shallow aquifer, which was the Wanapum. And then we have the deeper aquifer called the Grand Ron. Um, as you can see, starting in the 1990s, we have a graph here that shows that we were on a decline of about a foot per year. And we have seen that rate decrease, which is positive. Um, we have had very aggressive conservation, which we'll see in some of the pumping numbers that we'll present later in this, in this uh, slide deck. Um, but we still continue to decline. So we're still mining this aquifer and need to have uh, serious conversations about alternate supplies so that we can stabilize this aquifer and stabilize the future of our communities. This slide just gives you a brief update on our 2020 groundwater usage. Um, these are the total. Uh, these are the total uses for the major pumpers. Um, I guess the main takeaway here is that 2022 we pumped 2.28 billion gallons, um, and in aggregate, that's six percent less than what we pumped in 2021. Um, and markedly, it's 17 percent less than what was pumped in 1992 which just really, that was the year that our groundwater management plan took place. It, it, it took effect in 1992. Um, but the, the area is taking conservation seriously. Uh, both water systems run very tight water systems. Um, we have water loss rates that are well below industry standards for our water system. Um, and we have aggressive conservation market. Uh, I'd like to note that uh, Pullman this year implemented some additional new water restrictions for, uh, they established an irrigation season, which they had not previously had, that Moscow had. And we have conversations underway about a basin-wide conservation plan that would incorporate both cities, both universities and the county. And so we're really excited about those efforts. This is a geologic cross-section of our basin. Um, those of you who've been up to Moscow uh, may be familiar with the geography of the area. Directly to the east of Moscow, to the north and the east, sits what we call Moscow Mountain. 
Um, and there is an interface there at the mountain where the basalt comes up to form the mountain, or excuse me, where the granite comes up to form the mountain that was then over, over the centuries and millennia filled in with basalt flows. And so we have a small area of recharge that is along the front of the mountain. But once you get beyond that, you get into some very thick basalt and clay layers, which really is pretty prohibitive. We don't get much recharge once the water's in the basin. There's, there's not a lot making it down into the basin um, other than at that interface with Moscow Mountain. Um, so really that's the water cycle. This is slide represents the water cycle for the Palouse Basin. We have snow melt that, that, is, uh, that comes off our nearby mountain where the mountain meets the edge of the basin. Some of the water seeps into our basin. Um, and then, uh, as I noted, because of the heavy impervious clay and soil layers, we really just don't get much in infiltration otherwise. It flows out. Um, and so then that water is pumped from the aquifer, which is the sole source of drinking water for our major users and our major systems. Um, over the years, we've done a lot of research to identify what the need is, um, what we need to do. We know that we can't conserve our way out of the problem. Um, the region's target need is, uh, is 2,324 million gallons per year. Um, the way that that is calculated is that we use hist historic data, anticipated population growth um, over the next 50 years, and then we have an, an aquifer stabilization goal built into that number, which is 30% is what the estimates are for aquifer stabilization. Um, in 2022, uh, we had a consultant continue some work that had previously been done by another consultant. Uh, the first consultant, uh, Hook, identified in a broad way, all potential alternate water supply sources that could be available within the Palouse Basin. And then this additional effort narrowed and, took, and, and uh, looked at data gaps and tried to better fill in um, the analysis of the initial study so that we could move forward with uh, more targeted research toward a uh, preferred alternative that we can work on implement, for which we can work on implementation. And so the 2022 consultant considered uh, what percentage of the target would be supplied by each project, the capital cost for build out of each project, the capital cost for annual O&M for each project, and some project implementation timeline. They also did some preliminary work on uh, water rights and, uh, and um, other considerations like fisheries, tribal concerns, et cetera. So I'm going to run through what have become the, the preferred alternatives, the alternatives that we believe are feasible alternatives for us to pursue um, for an alternate water supply. Alternate one is direct use from the Snake River. Uh, this is a pretty simple concept. Uh, it's acquiring rights in the Snake River, pumping them up. As many of you may be aware, Lewiston sits quite a bit lower in elevation. From Moscow, it's about 1,500 feet lower in elevation. Um, and so this would pump water up from the LC Valley up onto the Palouse, where it would then be treated and transported to Pullman and Moscow. Um, this project has a fairly, fairly high capital cost up front, and it is not the cheapest as far as O&M goes, um, because we do have high energy costs to pump the water up the hill, treat the water, um, and transmit it that further distance, um, but also it has some of the highest reliability. The water's there, there's uh, significant water there, and what we represent is uh, fair. the use of the, that we would need on the Palouse is a pretty small drop in the bucket when it comes to what is flowing through the state. Alternative two, um, this includes uh, direct use from the North Fork of the Pal Palouse River, um, offer recharge from the South Fork of the Palouse, River or Paradise Creek. Um, and so this would involve the pulling from the Palouse River, a regional treatment plant that would then transmit water to Moscow and Pullman. Um, and then, as I mentioned, aquifer rechart. Uh, this project has a lower upfront capital cost, uh, lower O&M, um, a little bit less of a percentage of the supply of target. Um, and then it brings in just some additional questions that we need to work through as far as 
the water quality, um, what it would take to treat. Um, we have, we've had some monitors out on the Clouse River so that we can start to gather this data, um, but still some questions to be answered. Alternate three uh, is direct use of planning from Flanagan Creek. This would involve the construction of a reservoir on Flanagan Creek. There was a study that was conducted, oh, it's about eight, eight nine years ago now that looked at all the drainages on Moscow Mountain and identified which drainages had the best capacity um, for water storage, water supply, and then how it would be transmitted to the city. Uh, Flanagan Creek was identified as the preferred drainage on the mountain for uh, the necessary infrastructure to install a reservoir um, and then the ability to transmit that water to Moscow. And then it would, and, and this would be separate state line. Uh, this, this would not involve water crossing the state line. We would have Flanagan Creek in Moscow and then the direct use of South Fork uh, of the Bruce River for Pullman. Alternative four, uh, this is kind of a little bit more of a money ball alternative. This is a lot of, uh, a series of smaller projects, um, all contained within the basin. You have aquifer recharge from South Fork of the Blues River. You have aquifer recharge from Paradise Creek, Pullman wastewater reuse, moder Moscow wastewater reuse, and additional water conservation. Um, as we worked through this with our consultant, um, they generated what became called alternate number five, which is uh, rather than recharge, it's direct use basically of the South Fork of the, of the Blues River and direct use of Paradise Creek. Um, some of the questions about this, about this particular alternative, I mean, this is the least expensive. Um, it's the least upfront capital cost and it's the lowest O&M. Um, it also has a lower percent of the target supply that it represents. Um, and there are some questions as far as uh, when the water is available, uh, what sort of storage might be necessary for that water, um, how much, and what the response to the, the actual operational impact of shifting water supply seasonally might be on our systems. And so there's, there's questions that are there as well. Um, but alternate five became the alt alternative that we are focusing on now, and there are a couple of reasons that I'll run through for that. Um, one, the, the conservation component to that alternative we think is a good idea regardless, no matter what alternative is selected. If we can conserve more water, it might make a 50 year solution, a 70 year solution. Um, and so it, that is, it, that gives us a good low hanging fruit place to start with some more aggressive conservation. Um, another reason is, as you are all aware, we uh, work for and report to elected officials and the public. Several of the efforts in the past in this basin have uh, gone up in flames due to a lack of public involvement or public awareness of the project. Um, and some of the questions that we cer we're certain to receive is uh, whether or not we have vetted out the least expensive options and the options that keep uh, the alternatives within our basin. Um, and so we think it's important that as we go through these, that we do vet those least expensive options out Yeah, yeah I, I can't hear anything. I think any that be, oh, there he looks back. Uh, we think that that will be very important um, to, to quantify what we have in there and log the quality of that water, continue water availability and water rights evaluation, um, acquisition planning and execution. We really have to know if we're going to even be able to get rights and what that's going to look like. Um, and then evaluate our treatment alternatives, conceptual design preparation, as I mentioned, some of the storage questions that we'll have, um, and then prepare a desktop sitting evaluation for intake uh, at the water treatment plant in Pullman. Um, so we can look at what that infrastructure, what that might entail. Um, and then, as I mentioned early on, we are not at this point ruling out. We want to keep continue to bring all four and now five with the direct use with alternative five alternatives along because. We believe that we there are a couple of, of uh, concurrent things that are happening right now that really, uh, we believe, make it wise that we not put all our eggs in an alternative five basket and not continue to have open eyes about what could be a better alternative, whether that be the direct use alternative out of the Snake River 
or the reservoir on Flanagan Creek, they all have a lot of merit. One, as you guys are all aware, we are going through the adjudication of our basin right now. Um, and there were tribal claims that were made on surface water in our basin. Uh, that could really have an impact, especially on alternative five, um, depending on how the court decides to, uh, to award and deal with the water rights claims that were made by the tribe in the basin. Um, in addition, we have, and I'll let Paul speak a little bit more to this, we have a local utility company that is potentially considering uh, looking at some pump storage projects again, which back in the 60s and early 70s was a project that was looked at by the Corps of Engineers for this area to deal with some of the power shortages that they anticipated at the time in central Washington. Um, so, Paul, I don't know if you want to jump in or add anything there or clarify anything I might have messed up. No, you you didn't mess up, Tyler. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you really well. Great, thank you. Yeah, um, so alternative one, and as a utility, again, full disclosure, I work for Avista. Um, and you know, we do our integrated resource planning on a two-year basis, both for electric and natural gas. <clears throat> In that we kind of do a 20-year look out toward the future and given sort of the, the new clean energy landscape in the state of Washington, um, we, we're looking at pump storage as a potential alternative as a renewable resource. And so with that, we have done pump storage feasibility work in the past, although it's pretty superficial. Um, but I have brought um, this proposal to um, some of my leadership and we're just talking uh, still pretty high level, but um, about might we want to cost share on a feasibility study on a couple of pump storage sites, including this Lower Snake River um, site. So again, some of that cost share could come from PVAC as well as from uh, the utility to kind of bring alternative one along with the other other four alternatives. So, so again, we're still having conversations internally what that might look like. Um, but again, as, as Tyler mentioned, and you saw the O&M on a, a lift of 900 or 1,000 feet um, of elevation of that much water is is considerable. Um, so pairing it with a pump storage site could really reduce that O and M and and just some of those costs for uh, the basin itself. So uh, more to follow there. Thanks, Tyler. So as far as, as our ask for from the Idaho Water Resources Board at this point, uh, one appreciate just the press appreciation. Um, as you well know, we are working on two sides of a border with PVAC. We have two counties, two cities, two universities, and two states involved. It's, it's not a simple process, but we've been able to keep everybody at the table and everyone engaged. Um, PVAC does have uh, contributions for research from all the major pumping entities. Um, so we try and stretch those research dollars as much as we can um, in pursuit of getting this done. We're serious about this and we, are, we, we really consider ourselves no longer doing general research, we're doing targeted research. We wanna have targeted research toward identifying and implementing an alternative. Um, and so at, at this point, it's, the, it's the, um, the targeted research funds that we're looking at. The identified targeted research that we have right now is $365,000. Um, one of the things that is very helpful is IDWR and the Idaho Water Resources Board has been very engaged with us. Uh, your staff has stayed engaged with us, and we very much appreciate that. We have been able to use that engagement as leverage with the Department of Ecology in Washington. It, I think it helps motivate them to stay aligned, um, the level of, of sobriety and the serious nature with which you all have approached our water situation has helped us keep the pressure on and, and keep that pressure for alignment from the folks at DOE. And so what we really want to do is to be able to put together a funding package between I, the Idaho Water Resources Board, our local funding that we have in our research account, and the Department of Ecology to accelerate the research on these alternatives so that we can really move these forward. And so as we get clarity, as we get through the adjudication of the basin um, and get, get a better idea for what may or may not happen with some of the opportunities for uh, partnership with other local utilities, we have the rest of the information in place to solidify a decision and move forward. And with that, we'd be happy to stand for any questions, Madam Chair. Are there any questions? 
I guess I have one. If you were to pursue the uh, diversion out of the Snake River, would that would that would be in the Washington side? Is that correct? The specific site hasn't been identified, Joanne, but that seems to be a more likely site. Um, it, it it looks like that that might be more likely, Paul. I don't know if you have more insight on that. No, but uh, and then some felt recently um to what just i think we're losing your audio uh, i think we might have lost paul yeah we i, I think that um, some of the initial no. study work that's been done joanne does does seem to indicate that it might be on the washington side and and also there, the the preliminary review of the state regulations seem to indicate that it might be yeah. less legally challenging um, to move water from Washington to Idaho rather than Idaho to Washington. But that is part of the research that continues to need to be done is just vetting the rest of rest of that out and actually looking at both the legal framework and then just the physical ability of where is it best to site, what's the best route for pumping, et cetera. And then some of that could be influenced by the potential for partnership with the utility, because if the utility has a site that works better for them, then that really could influence that siting as well. That makes sense. Uh, just for everyone's clarification, the Clearwater runs into the snake at the state line between Washington and Idaho right there. So. It almost, if it's going to be a pipeline out of the snake, it would almost have to be out of the Washington side. That's correct. And the clear water is something that's been looked at as well as a potential for inversion from the clear water rather than the snake. But yeah, there, there are still just a few other variables that we need to get some clarity on before we could definitively say where that would land. Okay. Well, it's certainly interesting concept. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you for your participation and um, all three projects for informing the board. We have almost the entire board online uh, to understand these projects that are on our regional uh, sustainability list so we can move forward. We still have two more meetings where we'll continue to look at um, the remainder of the projects. With that, I'll turn it back over to Brian Patton. Okay. Um, uh, you're muted, Brian. Still no sound. All right, we're at this point in our agenda where we are up on some Sorry. other items. Oh, there we go. Now you're now I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, right, we're we're at other items, Madam Chair. Does anyone have any other items for the finance committee today? Any of the finance committee members? Madam Chair, this is Jeff. I don't have anything at this time. Okay. Dale, do you have any questions, comments? No. I'm good right now. Yeah. Mark? I guess not. How, Dean? No, no, Madam Chair, I don't have anything else at this time. Okay. Any other board members um, on the call? All right. I think we're good. So are we ready to entertain a motion to adjourn? So moved, Madam Chair. Okay, since we don't need a second, uh, I didn't ask for a vote the last time, so I'm going to be consistent and not ask for a vote again today. We're adjourned. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chairman. Thanks all, to all the presenters. See Thank you, you next time. Yes. Thank you to all the presenters. Thank you.